Good evening, everyone. Um, give it a minute here for different ones to log on. Um, of course, you can see this. Um, I won't be going through the complete Bible study tonight due to the internet problems and interruptions we have had. I have um, changed our internet and I've added, uh, I've ordered boosters. They did, have not come in, but we will. Uh, for all the Little Rock people, I did get a call today that someone thought that we were, our church was shut down, even including this Sunday. That's not so. We, uh, we, uh, we will be having services Sunday. I, I, everything uh, is clear for service. We just cautiously closed service last Sunday because we had several people that were um, exposed to the coronavirus that were uh, really there was only two, two or three people that were exposed to it to someone that had it but then they brought without any symptoms that back and it caused several people in our service or several families to be exposed so I just uh, extra cautiously canceled service last Sunday it has been now more than 14 days since anyone has been in contact with anyone that had the virus and they have been tested and, and with negative results. So there's no issues. Everyone's in the free clear as far as we know. And so therefore we will have service Sunday. Our governor in Arkansas has mandated uh, facial masks indoors and outdoors where social distancing cannot be maintained. So it does not apply to anyone that can maintain six foot social, this six foot spacing for social distancing. So everyone is, uh, can wear their mask into the church. We will maintain social distancing inside the church, uh, spacing of at least six feet uh, except for families that are have always been together, they can sit together without being social. Six foot distancing. Um, uh, but but those who are not together, you know, we'll, we will maintain six foot social distancing. So uh, the only thing we may have to work on there is the band, just to make sure that we get people spaced apart there. I'll ask Brother Michael Smith, our band director, to see that that is done. Uh, we will have the Bible study, uh, a very uh, uh, small breakfast in the dining room at 9.30. We'll have oatmeal uh, and, and donuts and coffee and juice, juices, uh, and so, We'll, we'll continue to have that. We will maintain the spacing there. Um, I will ask Sister Hannah with the little girls, if those girls are in mixed company that have not been together, they will need to wear a mask in their, in their classroom or not have the classroom. Anyway, I just think we need to be careful right now since seemingly that the numbers of coronavirus has risen even though it seems like the deaths have maintained have continued to be around one percent of those that have it have it or have had it in arkansas so i think we're still in in good shape as far as that's concerned it's good to have brother leah Ciprian on yes he is part of our family of the body of christ and so not wearing my suit and tie tonight because I, I knew that we're probably going to be have uh, interruptions by the internet. And so I wasn't going to continue to hold. I am going to, uh, of course, we will have our Bible study uh, Sunday morning, which will be posted in, in our service. Uh, Brother Painter and the media booth people will take care of that. Um, also, um, I'm asking, uh, I'm going to ask different ones to uh, 
um, write in your Bible questions. I put that on our uh, information. It should be showing up there on, on my page to either text me to my cell phone, I put the number there, or my email address, your Bible questions. And we'll address those questions. Uh, we may change even a little bit in our Bible study as far as how we're conducting that. I'm gonna start asking people to send in Bible questions. You write them in uh, uh, to us. You can text them to us like I've got, or you can uh, email them to me uh, one Bible question that I do want to address uh, in an answer is uh, how can you turn someone over to Satan uh, to say that the Spirit might be saved, 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, Paul dealt with that, so I, I wanted to deal with that. Um, I may talk us a little bit on it if, if we don't get interrupted here in a few minutes. Um, um, in fact, while I'm thinking about that, if one of you brethren listening would maybe text me the scripture in Leviticus where a man is not to... Uh, uh, be married to his uh, brother's wife or his father's wife, his father's wife. Um, that's a scripture in Leviticus. I haven't looked it up in a while, but one of you brothers could probably find it for us when I'm talking. Um, so, uh, again, I, the reason that we've been having these uh, internet interruptions the last couple of weeks is because of uh, my Wi-Fi here at home, but I have talked to them. They have cleared out my Wi-Fi and I've also upgraded from a residential customer to a business customer, which has increased our speed. We've got a 350 <laughs> a gigabyte upload speed, uh, download speed, and, a, and I think it's a 65 gig upload speed so they're supposed to get it, be getting that put in place um i was afraid they wasn't going to get it done today and that's why i was somewhat uh feeling like i probably should cancel uh the bible study this evening we'll, we'll try a little bit but we'll see how how far that goes Again, I am asking everyone, I, I would like to know what's in y'all's minds as far as Bible questions are concerned, uh, where I could deal with a little bit of the subjects that most of you know that I deal with a lot of prophetical subjects per, per, uh, uh, that, that I'm, you know, in the book of Revelations. I've been dealing with... Uh, Yes, we are having church Sunday, Sister Lois Estrada. We are having church Sunday. It is open. And so everyone that can, you know, can come out and be with us. And then those that have been coming online with us, we're glad that you're online with us. Um, I don't know if any of you brothers, I'm, I've asked you to look up the scripture in Leviticus um, where a man's not to have his wife's, his father's wife. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, I was going to maybe deal with that about how that you can uh, turn a brother over to Satan uh, for the destruction of the flesh. It's in 1 Corinthians in the fifth verse uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll back up to the uh, third verse and read down it says for I verily uh, as absent in the body but present in the spirit have judged already as though I were present 
concerning him that hath done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the whole leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Uh, Leviticus 18 and 8 and 20 and 11. We'll look at that in a minute. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice, of wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. You're not yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world of with the covetousness of extortioners or with idolaters for when men, uh, when others must need, for then must you needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man is called a, a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an a idolater or railer or drunkard or extortioner with such a one not to eat. For I have for what have I to do with to judge them also with out do you not judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth therefore put away from you among yourselves that wicked person. Okay, Leviticus, I believe it was in 1811, I believe. Let's see if that's the one we're wanting. Yes, the nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father. She is thy sister. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister. She is thy father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister. She's thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou art not to approach to his wife and thine aunt. Um, let's see, did I miss the one? Yeah, in the eighth verse, the nakedness of thy father's wife shall thou not uncover, it is thy father's nakedness. Um, so he's calling the father's nakedness his wife. Uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't have anything to do with that. That was against the law. Well, this scripture where Paul was dealing with this man that had his father's wife, he was saying that we need to uh, deliver such a one unto the flesh, uh, to, unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. So, and Paul mentioning here that he had made this judgment. Of course, that, that begins to deal with God's order. He was, the, uh, he was a chief apostle of the, of, of the Corinthian church. He was over those Gentile works. He was the chief apostle and the chief authority. Not every minister uh, has the same authority in the body of Jesus Christ. There's an order you know, the order of this world came from God's creation in the beginning and how it developed. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're uh, just like in any business on a job, there's order to every company. Uh, somebody's in authority. Somebody has to make a decision. Someone has to 
maintain order. Someone has to uh, determine or have a means of making sure that order is maintained. And that's done with discipline. Sometimes it's even done with uh, dismissing, you know, maybe an employee because they won't submit to the order of the company. Uh, it's, you know, if you want to get, if you want to get along with your boss, the way to get along with your boss and succeed in the company you're working for is to get that man's mind. You won't be able to agree with everything of every man. No one is ever able to do that because we cannot all think exactly the same and we're not on the same level in our thoughts. Sometimes, you know, I have said under men that I didn't agree with, it, it's in certain things that uh, in their operation of authority. I'm talking about in the ministry, the same thing in business. But some of these men were older and I learned that I was wrong and they were wise. They had wisdom that I couldn't see. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, and I've, I've had to learn this and... and uh, and being over churches, of course, I have the work in the Dominican Republic, a, uh, uh, a great work over there, some great people to work with, great pastors. And, uh, but I've had to learn, you know, sometimes how God deals with things. Like when I was younger, I wanted things to be dealt with exactly the way that, you know, that there was order to deal with. That's not always possible. You have to look at how, you have to learn how God looks at things. Sometimes you may have someone, I'm gonna give you an example, like I've had, many, I've had ministers that didn't agree with each other, pastors working in the same areas. They didn't agree with each other and maybe one of them was doing wrong in reacting to the actions of the other pastor. And the other pastor felt like because he was doing him wrong, he was working iniquity against him, which in fact he was to some extent. Then the, uh, but the one that felt like he was being done wrong was doing things that was causing such frustration to the other pastor that was causing the pastor to react the way he was reacting because he felt like what you're doing is tearing down the building of the body and, and what I'm doing is trying to build the body and therefore he may not have had the wisdom of knowing how to go about it and so he may have overstepped his boundary sums. But sometimes you have to understand how does God look at something like this? You know, God's slow to wrath. God is, is careful about judging. He doesn't judge something, he, you know, and we're not to judge a matter until the Lord comes. And that means until the Lord shows up on a particular case. Sometimes you have to tolerate, you have to be uh, flexible enough to uh, wait until you get the mind of God and see how God wants to judge some cases. Now, it's obvious that some cases are, we know how to judge. There's some things you know how to judge. Something that it is, uh, an outright sin. We we know we have to judge certain cases like that, but it, that all even depends on the baby. You know how 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 far along is this person in the Lord? And then you know there's people that come in. Uh, I've watched this. I've seen men. I've I've seen men come into the body of Christ and take a hold of the order and the the standards. Of, of righteousness that's put forth, in which we put forth standards of righteousness at a very high level, uh, the Bible level, uh, in, a, in a divine order. What we're looking for in a restored church, sometimes we require what a restored, re, restored church would require, and sometimes that's very difficult to maintain or to even achieve, depending on the, on the situation. But, um, so, uh, 
sometimes you have to look at it, how God, you know, when you look at how God has been so patient with the restoration, working with men, do you realize God started off working in the Catholic church, working with bishops in the Catholic church, uh, men like Huss, men like Wycliffe, men like Finally, Martin Luther, finally, God was able to give him enough strength to maintain a breakaway and start the Protestant movement. That wasn't his intent. And I don't think it would have been God's intent, even though I'm sure he knew it was going to happen. But I think he would have liked to seen adjustments made where he could work right there. But it wasn't possible that, you know, men are so slow to change and uh, they're so set that sometimes men think that they're, you know, they're violating a system or, and they may even be violating their own personal gain if they make changes. Sometimes changes are costly, but they're necessary if they're of God. Well, anyway, so when you're, you know, so what I'm just trying to show how authority, sometimes people don't agree with authority and I'm working, there, there's so many facets of it, but I'm working on the side of it of, of having to work with less than perfect situations, circumstances. And when you're working with a new uh, missionary work, which the missionary work in the Dominican Republic is not that new. I've been going there now for 19 years, almost 20 years. Next, the next uh, coming up February of 2021, I'll be there for 20 years. So it's not a baby work, but you know, I have had to go slow. And another thing you got to understand is I don't live there. I'm not working on that day by day. I, you know, I go over there several times a year, more times in the beginning than I do now. Of course, I haven't been over there since January of this year, uh, late January when I came home because of the virus. They, they've been shut down. They ain't even been able to have services like just like we've been over here. And uh, they've just opened back up also, but they're still having way more numbers than what we're having here. Uh, you know, I thought that when the heat came that we possibly would be uh, seeing this virus go away. It's not happening. The Dominican Republic, of course, is, you know, close to the equator and it's hot over there. It's, it's in the high 80s and 90s right now all the time year round it's in the 80s and uh so it's hot over there all the time but and it's about let's see there's 16 million people in the entire country we're here in arkansas we've got 51 million so they're like a third the side of arkansas the entire country and they've got more cases and more deaths than we've got in arkansas with, you know, and, and they're a third our size in number. So <clears throat> their numbers are up three times as much, nearly. So uh, some places, well, they've been shut down where you couldn't even fly in there, but you can fly in there now, at least the last time I checked. Uh, in some places you can fly in, but you can't, you can't go, go back where you came from. So it's been, I'm not planning on going over there till probably this fall. I'm hoping it'll open up for me to be able to go back over. Uh, but we're starting up a Zoom uh, meeting with the ministers and pastors over there. And I'm going to be doing live Bible teachings over there. Uh, that we're starting up for over there. So uh, anyway, let me get back to how the apostle Paul turned this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. In other words, this man was given over to the flesh, uh, operating in a wrong way. Um, Michael St. Arkansas has 3 million I think you need to look that up again. I looked it up just recently. We're not way littler than the Dominican Republic, We're way bigger than they are. So, um, but um, anyway, um, 
I, I probably won't be able to go back over there till things open up open up a little bit. But like I said, we're gonna we're 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 beginning to handle it with being on there live. And of course, they've got good pastors. It's got this message. Uh, they don't need me over there all the time, but I'm I am working with them uh, on some of these Zoom meetings. And calling it Zoom, I think we're actually going to probably go with we're maybe fixing to change over to Google's Meet because you can talk longer on that without having, unless you pay to have an unlimited amount. So anyway, um, uh, so um, let me here, just let me look up a scripture here. Yeah, um, so, <clears throat> oh, I, I know what I was going to say. Size, that's what, that Brother Michael, uh, what I was dealing with, I probably did say population. I don't know what I said, but it's 51,000 square miles, uh, uh, I believe, in Arkansas, and there's 16,000 square miles in the Dominican Republic. I was trying to obtain that it... Uh, established it's about a third the size of our country. No, they have over there, they have 12 million people in that country where we do have, I think, 3 million or a little over back in uh, maybe the um, 2019 uh, census. But... <clears throat> But anyway, so they've got, you know, like four times the amount of people and one third the geographical uh, area that we have as far as square miles, the size of their country. So it, so people are a lot closer together. And I'm sure that's why their pandemic numbers is so much greater than what ours are. Anyway, uh, back to Paul turning this guy over to the destruction of the flesh, turning him over to Satan. In other words, that's the operation. Satan means adversary. And the adversary to God, is that's the evil that works in, in the flesh of man. And um, well, Michael's saying, yeah, it's 53,000 square miles and they have 18. I knew I was close, so it's about the same. Anyway, uh, so... Um, uh, the the working of evil that works in man. You know, I don't care what you believe about uh, identifying the serpent, Satan, the devil, and the dragon, those four categories of evil. It doesn't matter how you uh, uh, do that. Brother Leah Cipriano is saying they have about 11 million. I've looked it up on Google and they're showing about 10, I think they showed 10 million Dominicans and 2 million Haitians is the population of the country, but he may have closer new figures than what I have because it's been a while since I looked it up. But anyway, um, uh, the... Um, the operation of, of, of the adversary or wickedness that works in the flesh of men. That's what I was going to say. No matter how you identify these categories of evil from Satan, it's working in the flesh of man. That's where it works. And so when you turn someone over, it's when someone violates the word of God and makes up their mind, what, is this, what does the psalmist say in in the Psalms one that blessed are they that, that uh, uh, let, let me read it so I get it just right. I know <clears throat> that walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Let me go to Psalms one right quick. <clears throat> Psalms 
Well, I didn't even put my suit on tonight. Y'all have to forgive me, I was running behind, but I thought I was gonna have a bunch of interruptions, which we haven't had yet. And uh, uh, so I was I actually was gonna get on here and just cancel the Bible study for tonight and uh, ask y'all for questions, but to begin to send in questions to me so I could know what's on y'all's mind and address some of those things. And it would help me with different subjects. You know, I only have one mind and I have to work through it, but I, I, I uh, am more than happy to, to look at your Bible questions and see if I can help in, those, in any, any of those areas. Here it is, Psalms 1 and 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. See, here he's standing, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So, you know, when you make up your mind, you're going to do what you know the word of God is against, or maybe you try to justify it by twisting the scripture some way, you've made a stand against the righteous law of God, the word of God, God's character. His character is a perfect character and it's righteous in everything. It's upright, it's wise, and it's, a, it's faithful in everything. In him, there's no, neither a turning, uh, there went that interruption right quick. Anyway, we, we will have that fixed, but uh, anyway, that's what I was afraid of. Uh, but these, a sinner, when you decide, see a sinner, someone that knows to do right, does it not. That's one of God's children. Ungodly don't know nothing about God and they just operate in the flesh. But a sinner is one of God's children and they make a stand. See, they stand against righteousness and decide they're gonna do their own thing. That's what Adam did when he decided he was going against God that's what men do when they decide that they're going to go against the authority or the order of God, they make a stand. And so they stand in the sea, uh, they stand in the way of sinners, uh, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. It gets worse. See, normally to justify yourself, you have to, you have to be a scorner. You got to be a judge. You got to judge. Others. It's always everybody else's fault. It's not my fault. It's everybody else's fault. That puts me in a seat of a scornful, a judge. I make myself a judge to judge everybody else wrong and myself right. So, uh, you know, it, it, it elevates to a greater evil from just making a stand to maintain your position in sin or order, which is sin. It's iniquity. Uh, but then you sit in the seat of the scornful. You let a minister judge somebody for doing wrong or violating their order, and then they run around, start running him down. They start, they're, they're scorners. They start judging others. They start trying to find people to justify themselves, and to do that, they have to run others down. The best thing you can do is if you, if you can't agree with your pastor, you know, I was going to say earlier, I've been under several men of God that's been over me in the Lord. And I never, I have never argued with those men. I've never fought with those men. I've always just put it on the shelf. What I couldn't agree with, I kept my mouth shut about it. I didn't scorn, no, I never was scorning about it. I never got in the seat of the center about it. Um, uh, uh, if I couldn't say something good about them, I kept my mouth shut. But I learned as I got older to learn how to build, get their mind, and put some things on the shelf that I didn't agree with. And I found out later what I put on the shelf that I disagreed with, I didn't disagree with it when I got older and saw the wisdom that they had. Yes, they were, they were having to recognize things that were not necessarily right, and they were having to support things that weren't done exactly like they'd see them, like to see them done, but they were always working to get it there. See, that's how God is. God cannot, he, he can't get us where he wants us yet. We're not there yet. He's been so patient. These 2,000 over, I mean, almost 2,000 years since the day of Pentecost, 
Um, and he's been working with the Gentiles, you know, since the falling away of the early church. And he still doesn't have us in a restored church. But he's patient with that. And he's working with something that is less than what he wants it to be or less than perfect. And men of God have to learn how to work that way. At the same time, they've got to be very careful not to be so out of balance that they're tolerating what God would not tolerate. See, that's why you got to get the mind of God. <laughs> and it's not easy. It's not easy to learn how to measure things the way God measures them. So there's things that, you know, we've got people in the body of Christ that are born again, new baby Christians, just been here a short time, been here for a good while, uh, uh, up to those that don't need, they're, they're fully in order, they've been around long enough, they've got they're where we're at in the Lord in God's rest, restorative process. They're generally older people, but you don't have to be older to get there. God can, you know, look, Jesus' disciples, of course, we're not in the same place they were, but they were young men. Jesus was only 33 uh, years old when he reached perfection. Uh, those, those men that sat under him were young men. Uh, you know, uh, Stephen was a, a young man. And so uh, younger men can be capable and very mature in the, in the Lord, excuse me. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> but this man, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in the law doth he meditate day and night and he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water bringing forth fruit in his season. Uh, his leaves also shall not wither whatsoever he doeth shall prosper, but the ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So <clears throat> there is an order. The apostle Paul was the man that judged that case that turned this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. In other words, he disfellowshipped this man and just turned him over to the spirit that he was of, which was the spirit of Satan. It was an ad, He was an adversary against the things of God, the righteousness, word of God that was being taught. He made a stand against that. And so Paul turned him over to that so that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, the spirit of the church, sometimes you have to excommunicate evil. If it's bad enough that it would affect the whole church, you cannot condone some things that are, it, it, it crosses the line. You know, this area I've been talking to you about, about how God's patient, God tolerates things to a certain point, but it's not immorality. It's not, it doesn't cross the line of disqualifying ourselves from even working with God. See, when you make a stand against the word of God and the order of God, and you're not in authority and you, you stand against that, you're committing iniquity, which is your own selfish way of doing things. And so uh, when someone does that, then they cross a line that will tear down order. And so sometimes it, you might work with it a while, but if you can't get it straightened out, you'll have to turn it over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that it's going to bring that person to save the spirit of the church, the body of Christ. You've got, we've got to maintain the right spirit and the right order uh, for the body of Christ. So this is, you know, it, it is, a, you know, someone asked that question, how can you turn some over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh to save the, the, the spirit in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, Jesus is coming for his bride and we've got to maintain righteousness and the right spirit that we can achieve uh, producing bride members at the coming of the Lord in the end of this Gentile world, just like he came in the harvest and for the, uh, to make up part of the bride in the early church.
Anyway, wow, I've, I've already talked a lot longer than I intended to tonight. But um, um, I want to encourage you again to to send in, you know, be thinking about it. If you're following our, our broadcast and our Bible studies, then I would like to hear, you know, when you come up, when you have Bible questions, I'd like to get your mind, your thought, your questions about it. And I'll try, and I'm talking to saints as well as ministers also, younger ministers uh, mostly that have Bible questions. Uh, you know, I'll try to address those. And, and that gives us, that helps me even to get, you know, it it, uh, uh, it provokes my mind, it provokes me to study it, provokes me to think, to indulge and to, the Word of God and some subjects maybe I haven't looked at in a long time. So it refreshes me also, as, as well as all of us together as we work on these subjects. I think there's no, nothing more interesting than the work of the Lord, the Word of God, the operation, the history, the uh, the workings of God and, and this, it's magnificent what's took place in the Gentile world. It's magnificent when you go back in the Bible. I'll just, sometimes I'll do that in my mind. I'll start thinking about, you know, the, the just the Bible. Uh, you know, I'll start thinking about the garden, Adam and Eve, what took place there. You know, the righteous line. Then uh, how God chose Noah, how that the righteous line began to mingle and intermingle and intermarry with the unrighteous line and God decided to destroy everything except, so he picked out a man by the name of Noah and his wife and their two sons and their wives and uh, their fam you know, and, and put them in an ark and started all over with everything. And then, you know, you, you, after Noah, you know, finally the ark subsided, you know, the water subsided, I mean, and the ark settled back on the earth and Noah started all over uh, trying to follow God's will. And he had those three sons, Shem, Ham, and uh, Japheth. And then you look at where those men, how those men developed, what happened out of that, and, and how that uh, God finally called a man uh, whose father was Tira, Abram, and changed his name to Abraham and, and uh, produced uh, uh, what the promised child, Isaac, and then how that Isaac had a son uh, by the name of, of Jacob. Of course, Abram had Ishmael also. You know, that, all these are just tremendous stories of how God developed uh, of re reconciling man back to him after the fall of Adam and how long it took. It took him 4,000 years to get the world ready to bring another garden, someone that had that garden experience, his son, Jesus Christ, sent from heaven. And uh, how that, you know, Isaac produced those men, Jacob, Esau and Jacob. What a picture of the flesh and right, you know, the, 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 man, uh, the righteous line of God and the man of flesh. And then, you know, watching Jacob and his 12 sons, the 12 tribes, what God had to do for over 400 years of putting those people through slavery to get them in a place that he could lead them and called a man by the, Mo by the name of Moses to lead them out and started a priesthood and a tabernacle and all of that that took place and sent them to a promised land, and finally, you know, they became a nation of people. You know, the story of Saul and David and, and Solomon, and then the divided kingdom of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and then the, the kings of, of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Judah and Israel, and the, all of the history that took place, the, the, those wicked and righteous kings of both uh, sides, that uh, had prophets of God that continued to work with them to bring them to a place that finally God was able to bring Jesus Christ into this world. When you look at all that history, you know, I mean, I've just kind of hit some high points there, but 
when you look at all the details of all those stories and all those men of God and the unrighteous men of men uh, that played such uh, parts in all that history, uh, it's so amazing. Sometimes I just sit back and my mind just kind of watch the, the movie of my mind of, of, of all that I've learned about that. And then there's so much more that I want to know. Uh, you know, you, you can't read the Bible without getting something new every time you read it and, and uh, finding uh, something that you maybe you never saw before and no matter how many times you've read it. And it's, a, it's amazing. And then when you look at what God's done in this Gentile world, there's things about this Gentile world I'd like to know more that we don't really have any history of, uh, you know, but God's got us to where we are and, and this body of Christ is a tremendous work of God that God has been developing uh, for all of this time. And uh, I'm so thankful that the Lord let me be a part of it. And my prayer is that I can stay here and, and uh, I don't know, I don't know if I can live long enough to be, a, you know, to see the restored church come into its operation, but I hope I can. But if I can't, I, I, I'm striving for that resurrection so that I know that I'll, I will be a part. I, I, I've got that confidence in my Savior that if I'll serve him, he will, he'll save me, he'll salvage me. And I've got that that sovereign trust in my Savior. And so I'm thankful tonight to be a part of all of this. I'm thankful for all of you. Thankful for the, uh, the opportunity to even get to talk to you. Many times I feel so unworthy to talk to the precious people of God. And um, anyway, uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm just very appreciative tonight. I'm looking forward to our service Sunday. I, I think I have a, a you know, greater uh, appreciation for just being together with the people of God in church services now that we haven't been able to have them at, you know, as, as regularly. We're still not having our Wednesday night services. I started to do that, but then I felt a little checked on it. I knew that when we went to you know, when they released us to go back to everything, I knew that the numbers would climb and I didn't really know what would happen. I still feel, you know, that we're going to get through this and I, I feel God's in it. I know he is. And I know that there's, God has purposes in it that we probably aren't able to identify. But let me just tell you this, God is in control. He's controlling this world and he's getting this world ready for the final prophetical hour of a restored church in the end of the Gentile world. And many things are gonna transpire, but we're nowhere near the end yet. We've still got, we've still got several years. My, uh, and I'm not, a, I'm not a, a projector of a certain year, or, Although in my time frame, I do have it worked out where I've got years worked out, but according to prophecy, but uh, so many men have missed that. I'm careful about that. But I don't mind telling you, I'm seeing the church will restore, be restored uh, around 2033. Do y'all realize that is only 12 years from this next coming January? And then there's a 15 year prophetical hour that'll follow that. And so 2033, there in 2048, you know, that would, that would, final judgment would come in the, the pouring out of the vials in the end of the last prophetical hour. Now that's, that's my position right now. I'm continue to study on it, look at it. That's the best I can come up with right now. But you'd have to know that, you know, there was 2,000 years in the Antediluvian world before, before the Jewish world, and the Jewish world had 2,000 years that finished up in a harvest and making up a portion of the bride. And now from AD 33, I'm saying around that time is 
the, uh, the day of Pentecost to uh, now, that would be 2033. But I, I don't necessarily get it by just adding that 2,000 years to it. I've got prophetical timetables that takes me there at the same place anyway. So what I'm saying, when you look at it, God created what Peter say, a thousand years is as a day and a day is a thousand years. God created everything in six days and the seventh day he rested. Well, six days, a thousand years is a day, Peter said, is 6,000 years. There's 2,000 years in the Antediluvian world from, from Adam to uh, uh, Moses that from Abraham to Christ was 2,000 years, I mean. So there's there, there's four days. There's a picture of that in the New Testament of Lazarus' resurre resurrection. He was, you remember Martha told Jesus when Jesus said, said, roll back the stone of his sepulcher. Martha said, he's been dead four days. He stinketh. Those four days represented that 4,000 years that no man had life until Jesus came to this world and on the day of Pentecost, he gave the baptism of the Holy Ghost and new birth of the spirit of God's character through the baptism of the Holy Ghost being born of a new birth, a new creature. Life came back into the soul of men. No man had life. They only had the life of Adam. They had, they, they had, a, they had faith for a better resurrection you know, from their death, but they no man had life. No man went to heaven. Read John 3, six, I believe it's in the 16th verse where it says, no man entered into heaven save he that came down from heaven. So, so uh, that was 4,000 years. Now here we are, and if you add 2,000 years to that 33, 2033, so we're looking at, we're nearing the end of the, you have to know we're nearing the end of the Gentile world. This world, look at the mess we're in. We're not just in a mess because of this pandemic. We're in a mess worldwide with civil power, with corruption everywhere. With, they can't, we can't hold nothing together. No one's, you know, they're, they're our own president, these two parties, the Democrat and Democratic and the Republican parties are falling apart. They're, they're so divided right now. I've never been this divided, don't seem like. And uh, I don't know that they'll ever get back together. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, they're pulling out all stops. So, so you need Jesus, saints of God. I'm telling you, we all need the Lord. We need his help. Hi, Sister Tansy. God bless your heart. It's good to see you on here. Um, Anyway, God bless your hearts. I don't know if I'm even running over. Can you believe I wasn't even going to talk today? And just, But once again, I want to say we will have service in Little Rock Sunday. We will continue our Sunday services, both Bible study, uh, light breakfast at 9.30, Bible study at 10, 10.45 to 11.30, band practice, 11.30 morning service upstairs in the sanctuary we'll see all of you then keep praying for our brother shelby weaver uh pray for our brother ron johnson's wife sister beth she's still she's doing good right now she's still an ongoing bout with cancer she uh she's she's not they haven't found anything right now they won't tell her she's cancer free they'll just tell her we're not finding anything right now but from time to time she has these little nodes are in her lungs and they have to remove them. They are cancerous. And so it's just been an ongoing thing. We're, we're certainly praying with them. Sister, uh, Sister McPhee, Brother John McPhee and his wife, Sister McPhee's sister passed away uh, this past Monday. Uh, they will have a, a visitation Monday. Uh, I don't know, Brother Painter, if you can put it up the funeral home on John F. Kennedy Boulevard. I can't remember the name of it right now. Colliers, would it? Maybe somebody put it up for us. Anyway, pray for that family, their comfort during this time of loss. Um, trying to think if 
uh, brother, of course, we want to keep continue to pay, pray for Brother Gary Wright in Houston at the Humble Assembly. He's fighting, you know, this cancer, this treatment that he's and those treatments really do affect him. Um, let's see, I think I can give you all that. But you might want to call. Now, you cannot, you can go inside at the visitation, but you have to go back outside. You just can go in, see the family, and come back outside. So I'm not sure who all might would want to go. Uh, we are certainly sending our condolences and uh, flowers. Are, we're actually sending help for the funeral uh, needs. And my wife and I plan to go to the visitation. Um, yeah, I was going to look at who. See if I can give you. Okay, right here we go. It's at the Robinson Funeral Home on Martin Luther King um, on, um, when is that? Monday, this coming Monday from 2 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So a lot of people will be working, may not be able to. Brother Elias Cipriano wants us to pray for Brother Mario Munoz Peña. He needs our prayers from the Dominican Republic. Pray for Guatemala, Brother Fide is asking us to pray for them over there. Pray for the Dominican Republic, the precious men of God, pastors and ministers over there, and those precious churches. They're, you know, they're they're suffering right now, and they need our prayers. So let's pray. Pray for the work over there. Uh, God is helping us. Uh, the work is is growing. And uh, we're thankful for those men, Brother Ciprian, Brother uh, Emilio Green, Brother Calderon, those men and then those ministers that work under them and with them over there. So pray for that work. Also the other missionaries' works in, in Haiti and in the Philippines and Honduras, Africa, uh, Guatemala. Uh, we've got a work now we're working in, in uh Puerto Rico, um, uh, Ecuador. Uh, what am I leaving out? I said the Philippines, I believe. Uh, uh, anyway, so remember those other works because they also have needs. I can tell you, it's just impossible seemingly to to get enough funds to be able to meet the needs that are there. We just do the best we can. I've mentioned in this last month and a half, less than two month period, we've sent $5,000 over to the Dominican Republic in a couple different offerings to the churches, trying to help them with and the pastors with, with food and other needs that they have over there. And that's taxing. We just, you know, it, but the Lord has helped us. The Lord's helped us. Thank you, all of you people that have sent us some missionary offerings and helped us during this time of need. And, and of course, we've always got needs, but there have been people step up and do more than, than what has been done in the past. And I want you all to know how much I appreciate it. Then the saints in Little Rock, they're all faithful. They're faithful to give to the missionary work, and they're also faithful givers in tithing and offerings. And uh, I know we weren't in church last Sunday, but you know what? The bills are still, they're still coming in. And so I hope you've saved your tithes and offerings to put in the offering this Sunday, or you may have mailed them in to Sister Durham. God bless your hearts. I love all of you. Pray for me. Pray for uh, the body of Jesus Christ, and I'll pray for you. God bless your hearts, and good night.